First of all, there is a moral and humanitarian uh, dimension here. Personally, I've been haunted for many weeks by the image of young Aylan lying in the sand in a Turkish coast. Um, also because my youngest son is about the same age. And I felt it was very unfair that uh, one child had the, the right to be safe and happy and many others didn't. So I think there's a, an obvious moral responsibility, but there's a political one. Many of those people come from conflict ridden zones like Syria, Iraq, Libya, Afghanistan. Uh, the situation in these countries uh, was also partly the result of our policies of military interventions, maybe with the best of intentions, but the results have often been catastrophic. So I think we have a political responsibility uh, to help mitigating the results of our actions. Indeed, the debate is, is very different in, in various European countries and I think uh, here applies the principle of where you stand depends on where you sit. Now, if you are uh, a Greek or an Italian and you have been faced with large numbers of incoming refugees and migrants, then your reaction and your positions may be very different than if you are in a country which has basically zero influx and you have been asked to share the burden. So that explains to an extent why you have different reactions. Uh, but also the, the, the solidarity question is a very sensitive one in the European Union. And people have to realize that you cannot have solidarity a la carte. Now, if, for example, you want solidarity because you feel there's a threat from Russia, then you cannot turn uh, your head to another direction when it comes to uh, population flows. So solidarity should be a commonly accepted principle uh, and the basis for our actions. Now, it hasn't happened that way so far, unfortunately. Now, can we develop a minimum of policies um, also respecting international law? It will not be easy. I think uh, one has to realize that the EU has a lot of potential and we can uh, integrate many uh, refugees and migrants. Unfortunately, we cannot take them all in. Uh, that should be the basis of our policies. But then uh, another common assumption should be that unless we respect common policies, then um, there is not much left of the European Union. And if this is the case, then we will be isolated, small or medium-sized countries, easy prey for big powers uh, in the world. We uh, focus very much on the Syrian refugee crisis, but this is only the tip of the, of the iceberg. Because even if uh, somehow there is a diplomatic solution in, in Syria tomorrow morning, and all refugees uh, start returning to their uh, villages and, 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 and cities, there will still be large numbers of people from other conflicts, uh, from uh, poor and overpopulated countries in, in Africa and, and, and Asia, and also uh, victims of climate change that will be trying to come to Europe um, for the next many, many years. So we need urgently not just a refugee management crisis, but a migration policy uh, over the long term. Certainly we cannot resolve, we cannot manage the problem unless we cooperate with uh, some of our neighbours. Both those countries that do host a large number of refugees uh, from conflicts like Syria and elsewhere, but also countries of origin. Uh, now, there are various tools in the European toolbox that we can use. Uh, the obvious one is economic assistance, and we need to do much more and more efficiently. But I think we tend to forget sometimes that there will be some difficult dilemmas and decisions ahead. For example, you look at a country like Egypt, with almost 90 million people, and economic, social and political problems. Now, if it comes to choosing between stability in Egypt and avoiding large influx of refugees or immigrants from that country, or democracy, what would be the choice for the European Union? Is it interest or values and principles? Uh, and I think these will be tough questions for our neighborhood policy and also the European global strategy.